Hello, I'm Natasha Hussein, and this is Newsfeed, your dose of what people are talking about online. U.S. universities and colleges are on edge as pro-Palestinian protests continue to spread across the country. The protest started at Columbia University on April 17th, with students demanding an immediate ceasefire in Gaza and divestment from companies linked to Israel. It wasn't long before students at other East Coast institutions like Yale, Harvard and Brown quickly joined in the movement. Sit-ins spread to the West Coast, with students at Cal Poly Humboldt barricading themselves inside a building. Many other schools set up encampments too. In a matter of days, protests spread countrywide and there are now about 50 sit-ins at institutions across the U.S. Hundreds of students have been arrested, yet protests show no signs of fizzling out. Faculty members at California, Georgia and Texas universities have also passed largely symbolic votes of no confidence against their bosses. The protests have yet to reach the scale of major student protests in the late 1960s against the Vietnam War or protests in the 80s against South Africa's apartheid regime, though commentators say it's the most significant demonstrations of the 21st century. Our correspondent Andy gives us a first-hand look of the ongoing movement from where it all began at Columbia University in New York. We're now entering week two of this tent encampment here at Columbia University, the one that has set off all these other protests around the nation and the world, in fact. It does remain calm here, and all of this blowing up on social media, as you might imagine, especially pointing out Columbia's long history of social justice activism, going back to 1968 and the anti-war protests in America that really also originated right here at Columbia University. In fact, there is a social media post now making the rounds of a woman who was apparently part of those demonstrations in 1968, telling the crowd here to keep going, keep going. They will concede if you just keep going. Palestine must be free. And Palestine will be free. So when I saw the Gaza in uh, solidarity encampments at Columbia, and that they were saying that they were inspired by what we had done 56 years ago. We took over buildings, totally illegal, but we took <laughs> over buildings. Courageous students at Columbia, they risked and suffered both suspension and arrest, insisting the university end their complicity by divesting from the racist genocide in Palestine. Another post saying that Colombia is on the right side of history and showing the two photographs back to back, a black and white photograph from 1968 here at Colombia and today, 2024 at Columbia. But as yet, no resolution in sight, no indication that the university is going to concede to or give in to the students' demands that it divest from Israeli businesses. So the big question remains, how and when all of this gets resolved? But the protests are not just limited to the U.S. They've spread to universities in Canada, the U.K., France, Italy and Australia, revealing a growing international solidarity movement. cannot and we cannot allow ourselves to just be concerned with our own personal priorities. This is bigger than us. Seeing, you know, our brothers and sisters across the pond working well, fighting for Palestine, it was inspiring for us. Side. And our university is directly complicit through partnering with institutions which pro profit from the, the slaughter. We're here in solidarity with Gaza, we're here in solidarity with the people of Palestine, Palestinians all over the world. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free.
Donna Alshire is a student at the University of Melbourne in Australia. She's from the Occupied West Bank and is one of the founders of an action group for Palestine on campus. Now, Dana, thanks for joining us on Newsfeed today. And your collective, Unimelp for Palestine, you've set up a Gaza solidarity encampment. And from what I understand, you're there now. Yes, um, we started the Gaza Solidarity Encampment five days ago. So this is day five of the encampment. And um, it's 10, almost 10 p.m. right now in Melbourne. It's cold and dark, but there's approximately 60, 70 people at the encampment right now. All right. And what are you demanding from your university? So um, Melbourne University has um, multiple ties with the world's largest weapons manufacturers and other manufacturers, including Lockheed Martin, VA Systems, um, Rosebank Engineering, um, Boeing, just to name a few. Um, so we're demanding the university to cut all their ties with weapons manufacturers and end their complicity in the genocide in Gaza. Because our university, unfortunately, is receiving blood money from these companies and is producing research that has not been disclosed, and we do not know the nature of that research, that will be used to produce and develop weapons. So we're demanding divestment, we're demanding disclosement, we're demand, demanding a clear moral and ethical stance on the genocide in Gaza and a condemnation of what's happening in Gaza. And we're demanding a complete end to all forms, com, forms of complicity in the genocide in Gaza. A video of you recently went viral where you repeatedly questioned your vice chancellor on the university, university's $13 million partnership with Lockheed Martin. We're just going to play that thought right now. Why does our university have a partnership with our manufacturer company with this place? What could Mars come? They're literally, literally supplying weapons for active genocide in Gaza right now. I'm not going to teach you about that. I'm not even. Why? Why? You should ask the students, but the students Sorry. are here. You should ask the students. We're the Biden house. Tell me what to do. I don't think. Since then, has there been any clarity from the university on the nature of that contract with Lockheed Martin? Okay. So um, just to, to put something out there, Natasha, it's not just Lockheed Martin. Our university has multiple ties with diff at least different 16 weapons manufacturers, Lockheed Martin being the biggest one. Um, well, there's new news today. Our Vice Chancellor Duncan Maskell resigned today, and we strongly believe that he resigned due the, to the pressure of the Unimal for Palestine campaign demanding the university to disclose what kind of investments and what kind of money they're receiving and what kind of research is being done under the umbrella of the ties with Lockheed Martin. So we met with the university um, a couple of times when we first started our campaign um, a few months ago in December. And um, they were extremely clear on not cutting ties and refusing to cut ties with weapons manufacturers like Lockheed Martin. So far since 2016, they've received $3.5 million from Lockheed Martin working on research such as T4IFR, which is an advanced algorithm that is being used to develop drones and military autonomous weapons and airspace um, equipment. Some welcome news that he has stepped down. He wasn't being accountable. He wasn't answering any questions that you were asking. But yes. what happens next? Has there been any clarity from the university? So um, we need to... We understand here that this is not a one-person decision. This is institutional complicity. Melbourne University, as an institution, as a body, is complicit. Even if they change the vice chancellor, Duncan Maskell, and put someone else, it's not about a one-person decision, but the entire system that is complicit and collaborating, collaborating with the um, in the oppression of the Palestinian people and different people, different oppressed people around the world. Because these weapons ties have been going on for years and years. This is not new. So even if Duncan Masco resigns, that does not necessarily mean that we're going to stop fighting because we're not going to stop fighting because this is institutional complicity from Melbourne University. And uh, just before we go, what has your experience been like as an outspoken Palestinian student on campus in Melbourne? Yes. Um, so I have, in the past two years, um, I have been called a terrorist. I have been called a liar. I have been called many names for being outspoken about Palestine. But specifically today, on day five of our encampment, I had two different interactions with two different Zionist students where they cursed words that I will not be able to, to tell you unlikely, but they cursed at me and they almost wanted to fight and I de-escalated the situation. And I had a civil conversation with them and yet they refused to acknowledge that there's a genocide. They said that this encampment is anti-Semitic despite the fact that we have Jewish students and Jewish, Jewish staff member encamping right here with us.
So my experience has been, um, I can't say it has been the greatest, but it has been um, a shared experience for many Palestinian students and pro-Palestinian students across campuses around the world. Thank you, Dana, for coming on USV today and um, making your voice heard across campus and across the world right now. Thank you. Thank you for having us, Natasha. As the global public calls for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, the few aid groups that have access to the besieged enclave are ramping up their operations to get food and supplies to those in need. World Central Kitchen has announced that it's resuming operations in Gaza less than a month after it lost seven aid workers in Israeli airstrikes. The nonprofit is building a new field kitchen in central Gaza that will be named after Damien Sobol, one of the seven volunteers killed on April 1st. While the Israeli army apologized for the attack and called it a grave mistake, the NGO is still demanding an impartial and international investigation into the strike. World Central Kitchen's work has been essential to delivering food to starving Palestinians, supplying more than 43 million meals since October 7th. The group's operations account for 62 percent of all international aid in Gaza so far. In Europe, the Portuguese government has rejected a suggestion by the president that it pay reparations for slavery and other colonial era crimes. President Marcelo Rebelo de Sousa said last week that Portugal takes full responsibility for the atrocities committed during, the trans, during transatlantic slavery. Campaigners have long urged Portugal to address its legacy as a European country with the longest involvement in the slave trade. De Souza had said that Portugal could pay reparations by cancelling the debts of former colonies, introducing credit lines or financial packages. From the 15th to 19th century, 6 million Africans were kidnapped and forcibly brought across the Atlantic by Portuguese ships. Those who survived the perilous journey were sold into slavery, mainly to Brazil. Profits from the slave labor went to Portugal. Let's end on a lighter note. You know how cats love to go inside cardboard boxes, right? Well, one kitty was in for the ride of her lifetime, or one of her nine lifetimes, after she was accidentally shipped across the US. Galena's owners didn't notice she was hiding in a large box of shoes when they returned a package to Amazon. Unaware of their cat's whereabouts, the Clarks put up missing posters and searched for their pet for over a week. Meanwhile, in a California warehouse, Amazon employees noticed the cat, Galena, had spent six days in a taped box with no water or food. Her rescuers took her to a vet, and thanks to her microchip, she was reunited with her family soon after. Miraculously, she was completely fine, except for some mild dehydration. I guess cats really do have nine lives. That's our show. Find our latest stuff on YouTube and do subscribe to our channel. See you soon.